I'd give myself is should we bring back rock against racism? Um, just just to introduce it a bit. Um, I've, I've been travelling around doing lots of talks about the history of the anti-Nazi league and rock against racism, obviously connected to the book. Um, but I gave a talk last night in Edinburgh and Pete definitely has been to both events. So I thought I'd try and do it differently. Normally what I do is a kind of narrative, a story and you know about the NF and Lewisham and things like that. Um, today, I thought I'd do something that's more present focused and it's more kind of more kind of about the idea and about the notion of a model. Can we look at this period of history as a model for how anti-racist, how anti-fascist should be organised in today? So, first of all, I say you're a bit you, you guinea pigs. Um, <laughs> I haven't given this talk as a talk before, and um, literally, I'm hoping it works. But it's a bit like fingers crossed that it works. Okay. Um, I guess everyone in the room probably saw John McDonald's um, press release, which it's the way of the world these days, it was originally a tweet and then it became a press release saying that we should bring back the anti-Nazi league last year and um, you know he shared it on social media, tens of thousands of people liked it and it seemed to um, strike a chord, people liked the idea of bringing back the anti-Nazi league rock against racism. And um, I'll just sort of read out what he actually wrote particularly in the press release. He said, maybe it's time for an anti-Nazi league type Cultural and political campaign. The anti Nazi League pioneered um, hugely influential cultural movements like Rock and Racism, which attracted tens of thousands of people to anti racist festivals and protests. So I thought maybe to start off with, I'd talk about why this idea of bringing back Rock and Racism connects, why it actually seems to fit the moment that we're in. Um, and I'll come to it in a second, talking about Rock and Racism itself and why it worked, but I'll just start off if I can with kind of what the movement had as its antagonist. Because there's never any point <coughs> telling the story of anti-racism, anti-fascism, that actually starting with the racism and the fascism they're against. If you don't know what they're opposed, you can't understand why movements took the decisions they did. And just the first thing to convey is that, you know, if, if anyone has a notion of, like, what was the worst, most racist decade in British history, the 1970s would be pretty early choice. Um, and I don't just mean things like... Um, the ubiquity of racism on TV, the absolute ubiquity of TV programmes whose sole joke was, oh look, the people who come to Britain and they're funny because they're foreign and you're going to show these people being a bit but not too racist against them. And that was just, you know, literally, you could probably reel up half a dozen um, TV programmes which did that, not just as a one-off thing, but was their whole idea for four, five, six, seven series of programmes just with one idea. You could talk about um, the violence, and, and that's important. You know, at the start of the 1970s, you get, for the first time in Britain, you get um, groups of young white people almost turning into a sport, going particularly in the east end of London, and just literally attacking people because of the colour of their skin. And we've got no reports that happened before the 70s, but we have that at the start of the 70s, we have it at the middle of the 70s, we have it at the end of the 70s. If you think about, um, say in summer 78, uh, the National Front has one main paper cell in London on Brick Lane, and they try and turn it into a kind of pogrom. They get three or four hundred people together, march down from one end of Brick Lane to the other, literally smashing every single shop window, beating people up as they go along. Um, these things actually haven't happened that much in British history. You know, they happened at Notting Hill um, in 58. Um, Maybe they happen kind of around Oldham, maybe around 2001. But you really have to struggle to find any other moments. But in the 70s, actually, we have a whole bunch of moments like that. You have a sense that racism is immediate, striking, imminent in people's lives. Football terraces, um, in, in council estates, and in factories. That's, again, something which is really hard to think of a counterpart today. You have a bunch of... Um, attempted strikes which are about um, trying to deal with problems of, of discriminatory treatment of black and Asian workers. And then, because you've got a bunch of white foremen, managers, whatever, who quite like the system, almost turn on the head and become white campaigns to maintain um, literal privilege. You know, we get very engaged with the notion of white privilege in the present, but often we talk about it as a metaphor. This really isn't a metaphor. I'm talking about jobs where people literally were bounded into pay grades according to the colour of their skin. People try to challenge that, and then other people try and maintain it. Um, that happens at Mansfield Hosiery, it happens at Imperial Typewriters. At Imperial Typewriters, it actually ends with bunches of white workers marching um, through, the, through the city and behind a banner saying, white workers of Imperial Typewriters, and one of them going on a National Front election campaign. 
Again, that's, you know, we rightly think things are pretty bad now, but there's a notion of pretty bad that's actually worse than anything we're facing at the moment. And, and behind all of these were a recurring experience, which is that relatively small groups of people would come to Britain and be subject to um, press campaigns which would exaggerate the numbers of people coming, exaggerate the threat that was posed to everyone else. Um, the Kenyan um, Asian migrants in 68, the Ugandan Asian migrants in 72. The one I often talk about because this led to a big spike in racist voting for the National Front was the Malawian Asian immigrants in 76, where, where every single national newspaper, including the likes of the Mirror, united in terms of warning of, an, of, a, of a flood of Asian migrants that was going to come to Britain and overwhelm everyone here. What was it based on? It was based on two families in one hotel in Crawley. That was the substance to the press campaign of whipping off fear about more people coming in. Um, and, and one of the things I try and talk about um, in the book is, is how there's a connection between when you get that kind of racism from below, how it connects to racism from above. Um, for example, in July 76, there's a debate in the House of Commons um, about migration, which is opened by the Tories. It, it's something they've called for. Um, and just one of the speakers is a man called John Stokes. He says, um, we're only having this debate because of growing support for the National Front. If immigration doesn't stop, there'll be an explosion of wrath from ordinary English people, such as we've never known in our long history. He said, I've seen my task as an MP as that of trying to keep all the best in it that's in England and to be able to hand on to my children, as my father handed on to me, a country to be proud of, a homogenous nation, sharing the same faith, history and background. He talks about um, um, black and Asian migration to Britain. He says, the immigrants who come here will just have to return to their homelands and their families. Uh, the point is, this is a Tory MP. <laughs> you know, it, it, there's, a, there's a level of racism there which, which is um, very, very widespread indeed. Um, but it's got a connection to the racism of the far right. One of the metaphors the far right, at um, this point, uses about itself, they have a magazine, they call it Spearhead and have a notion that they're the spearhead of an attack on black people, but also an attack on everyone's collective rights. But they're at the front of that. Um, and again, I mean, it's just, you know, it isn't always the case in the history of racism that racist far-right parties play that role. It's, it's, you know, it's not the case if you were to talk to a bunch of people today in Britain just, you know, going, growing up, going to school, having to, you know, as a black and Asian person in Britain, is the biggest enemy in your life Tommy Robinson? Actually, probably a few, few people would agree with that. Is Tommy Robinson leading to you being attacked in school? No, not really. He's unpleasant, I don't like him, but he's not the spearhead. National Front really was the spearhead of racism at this moment. So coming now to Rock Against Racism and kind of what it represented um, as an alternative, and, and Again, I, I can't really do this in more than a couple of sentences because I want to talk specifically today about rock against racism. Um, rock against racism isn't the totality of the anti-racist movement. N neither is rock against racism plus the anti-Nazi league the totality of the anti-racist movement. Um, some of the most effective campaign against the National Front takes place as early as 1974. It's pioneered by a bunch of trade unions in Leicester who, who develop a tactic of exposing John Tyndall, the leader of the National Front, as someone who spent his life in neo-Nazi parties and using pictures of him in neo-Nazi regalia as a way of exposing that. Um, it's not any particular group on the left that does that. They get written out of the history, but they're important. There's a whole history of black um, anti-racist organisers, which I'm not particularly going to talk about today, but if you want me to talk to you about half oh, about that, I'm really happy to, because there's loads and loads of you can say. It's a really exciting story, too. Um, you could talk about how other traditions on the left were doing anti-racist work, as well as people I'm kind of mainly talking about today. You know, for example, um, in 1974 at Red Line Square, a member of the International Marxist Group, Kevin Gately, is killed on a demonstration. He's the first peaceful demonstrator to have been killed by the police in the Second World War. That really forces that group to, to think, what is our anti-racist or anti-fascist message going to be? And they do interesting things with it. Again, I'm not talking about that, but I want people just to have a sense that, that the groups I'm talking about, it kind of wouldn't work if there wasn't a really large viable left all around them that had lots of kind of ecosystems and lots of different cultures that were actually doing quite useful things. I'm focusing on one or two, on one group, essentially, but, but they wouldn't have worked if it was just them. 
Um, and then everyone thinks that's just, you know, sorry, <laughs> that's not how that's not how, how healthy left-wing politics is built. Right, so to come on to rocket race now, why does rocket race work and why might people want to revive either the anti Nazi League or rocket against racism? Um, I suppose the first thing to convey is that this is a mass movement. And we use the term mass movement um, a lot, and we use it kind of loosely. It's like anything that I'm involved in is, is mass movement. Anything you're involved is into mass movement, sorry. Um, that's kind of how the left works. But this really is a, this really is a mass movement. Um, give an example, right? Um, in 1978 alone, Rocky and Strayson organised 300 gigs, five carnivals. Um, the carnivals, you know, the one in Edinburgh has 8,000 people, two in London have 100 and 120,000 people. Um, 200 gigs, 13 local carnivals. So in 1979, um, 200 gigs and 13 local carnivals. Rock Against Race in 1979, militant entertainment tour, advertised with the image of giant fluorescent pink rhino, and slogan Nazis are no fun, featured 40 bands at 23 concerts, doing like the Ruts, Specials, and Angelic Upstarts. The tour covered 2,000 miles from Cambridge, Leicester, West Rumpton, and deepest Norfolk, and culminated in the six hour final show at Ali Pali. You know, this is something that involved a lot of people. If you were to try and add up just, okay, the following people the numbers that go to a concert, the numbers that organise and build a concert, the numbers that paint out graffiti, the numbers that leaflet, and you try and add that up and try and get a sense of how many people are involved in this and doing something. I don't think it'd be unrealistic to say you're talking about about half a million people. So like 1% of the entire British population. You know, that's good. That's what, that's what I'm moving to. We want them all to be on that kind of scale. Um, another thing I want to convey about Rock Against Racism is that it starts small and it starts with a bunch of people who, who, who do their politics in a cultural way. And kind of all of us have been around the left any time. We know that and we know the difference. You know, there are some people who are really, really, really good at some papers, um, doing petitions, talking to people on the street, building meetings, organising coach, and that's good. And in Rock and Strayson, that personality type was present. But the people who plan it, um, the first guy's man called Red Saunders, um, he, how he does politics is he's a photographer. He photographs, he photographs demos, that's how he makes his money. Um, how does he do politics? He's been in an agit prop theatre group. Who, who wander around the country every time there's a strike. Three or four of them put on a little a kind of mini theatre skit trying to spread the stories and ideas of strikes so other people can, can copy that. Um, and he's the key individual. And the people around him, they're photographers, they're designers, they're artists, um, they're writers. They're actually, as it happens, relatively few musicians. I don't know, like Tom Robinson is right at the top of his game at this point. He sends, he's got a mate. And she agrees to like go along for Rock and Race and becomes his representative. And she becomes first Rock and Races in full time in Cape Web. But there are actually relatively few musicians at these meetings. But if it, I suppose what I'm saying is, if it just been the politicos, the political, political, politicos without the cultural Bolsheviks, I don't know that it, it would have worked. Uh, maybe it would have, but I don't know. Um, another thing I want to convey about Rock Against Racism is it had a really interesting kind of duality about the notion of confrontation with fascists. Because we kind of think on the left that basically there are, there are kind of two real approaches. One approach might be to say, all right, um, if the far right are in your area, they've got to have a platform because that's freedom of speech. That's so one approach you want to let them talk. And that's an approach. I'm not very interested, but it's an approach. And then obviously another approach is to go, right, they're organisers, so you can't allow them platform, so the most important thing is to shut them up and not let them speak. Okay, and we call that no platform. That's an approach, it's more interesting. Neither of them was really how Rocky and its racism worked. What it did was, um, one of the things, one of the decisions that happened really early on in the campaign, they said, like, punk's happened, so we've got to relate to punk. And then punk's kind of going down the pants slightly. They've had sex pistols and they've burnt out. You know, sex pistols were done an interview with us. We were quite proud of ourselves in sex pistols. But the sex pistols have burnt out. What are young white racist skinheads listening to? Oh, they're listening to Sham 69. So this is the band that's got the most appeal to young racists. All right, we've got to talk to them. We've got to talk to the band. Persuade the band to break with the racism of their roadies. 
a whole bunch of their roads in the British movement on the National Front, uh, breaks the, the racism of their milieu, and I'll argue against it. Okay, the band says that, great. I understand it, they come out against racism, great. Okay, now we're going to put on gigs with them. We know that these gigs are going to attract young people who are going to go there and shout um, what we've got, fuck all, National Front. We know that we're carrying that risk, but we're going to invite them into our space. We control the setting of the space. A white band is going to end that evening playing with a black band, and that is an absolute rigid rule. But we're going to have people probably trying to storm the stage. Are we happy with that? It doesn't sound very safe. Yeah, we're happy with that. There'll be fights. We're happy with that. And you know what? If they, if they get tasty, we really are going to fight them. We're very serious about that. But it's a really interesting combination of both being willing to do the physical confrontation when people started acting on their racist politics, but actually trying to win the people with racist ideas in their head, having an idea that quite a lot of these people are winnable. Quite a lot of them are actually just young, unemployed kids who have a sense, you know, no real sense of their future, and that's why they go with racism, and you can move them away from that. And that's quite a daring move to make. Um, but, again, that's something that Rock Against Racism did, it was structured into the process. Um, another thing I want to convey is um, how Rock Against Racism was really good at catching a cultural moment, a moment you know, punks breaking through, the sex business has gone down, down the interview sex business. So they go after the clash. We really need to have the clash playing on our stage because they're going to be the new coming band. Um, and then they help to change the clash. I mean, anyone who's listened to a clash album knows, you, know, you listen to White Riot, just you listen to it as a song, I'm not talking about the lyrics, it's a song. It goes, it's trying to be the Ramones. There's no rhythm, there's no silence in the sound. And then you compare it with the way the bands go by the time you get to White Man, Hammersmith, Pallet. And they're trying to listen to black music and they're trying to change the way based on that notion of cultural fusion. And they've got that because they're performing on stages together with black acts. That music is there and they're hearing it. So the sense that Rock Against Racism is trying to engage with the most exciting cultural things that are going on. And the last thing I want to convey is kind of exactly the same process, but in reverse. That one of the reasons why this works is that where popular culture at is it needs a political answer to problems in musicians' lives. Um, and the problem is, you know, the immediacy of the Second World War, the problem is the presence of all these images of the Second World War, the problem is the way the older generation talk about the Second World War in the most boring, hateful, listen to me, we suffered a lot, so you've got to do what we want sort of way. And the younger generation is trying to revolt about it, but the first form that that revolt takes is wearing swastikas. And that's the wrong way to revolt against it. Or, or another example, just from the story of the clash. Um, anyone might have seen you know, those international clash day a couple of days ago. So lots of people sharing the footage of the clash going on stage at Victoria Park at the first carnival. And you'll see um, the clash storm on stage, uh, Sham 69 joining, but the singer from Sham 69 joins in the late song. Then at the end of the stage, they want to carry on playing, plugs are ripped out. There's real tension. Practically fist fights between them and the organisers of this rock against race and kind of what the hell's going on? They weren't headlining. They had to headline. It was really important to headline. They couldn't be as an anti racist anti fascist without being the most important story there. And, you know, actually the organisers wanted to have black bands have a biggest, better set. So why do they need that to be so important? Well, one of the reasons is that um, Joe Strong, a uh, clash singer, um, his brother had been in the National Front. David Strummer. Uh, no, no, Joe Strummer's a student, it's dead as something else, but it doesn't matter. Um, but um, he'd actually killed himself. So Joe Strummer had been having to deal with the last three or four years, the whole thing of like National Front's been something that was immediate, that was in his lives, that he needed an answer to. It's actually the most important thing he could imagine. And suddenly there's a bunch of political people saying, We can explain this. We've got an answer, we can show you something you can do with your cultural politics. It takes anger, the, 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 the guilt, maybe, that you felt all this time, and turn it in a direction which changes how other people think. And so culture needed that politics. That, again, is part of the story, again, part of what makes it so exciting. All right, so, so gone through quite a lot of one, one time. Come on, final third, basically, to maybe say something which might be surprising, given all that I've said so far, which is, um, should we bring back rock against racism? Which the answer's got to be, the sense has got to be yeah, um, but how? And the more you ask the question how, you wonder if the answer really is yeah. 
or if it's a yes, kind of a different yeah from the obvious yeah. The obvious yes is going, yeah, yeah, we've got to bring back rock and we've got to have something that copies it as closely as possible. And what I'm to try and talk a bit about is why that isn't the answer and why that isn't the way that you make movements that can change things today. Um, and I'll start off with just one example to, to kind of re-establish rock and racism, which is something I'm part of and I like and I'm glad it's there, which is a Facebook group I'm in called um, Bring Back Rock Against Racism. Not the question mark, it's an injunction, come on, but bring back rock against racism. And it's set up at the end of last year, and in about two weeks it went from two people to like four or five thousand people. And they put on gigs and they sell merchandise, and it's great, love them. But all they ever do is they put on ska bands and punk or oi bands, and it's the music of the 70s, and it's the cultural experience of the 70s. It's never now. It's never now's crisis, it's never now's moment. Um, and it's kind of worth remembering that, that, in a sense, there's a reason why rock and racism took the form of music, which is that actually it felt like racism was quite seriously entwined within music and, and expanding. I'm, I'm not going to repeat anything I've said already. But, you know, people, I imagine everyone in the room wants to know the example of Eric Clapton and the speech he gave. Yeah. Um, but I think a better example in a lot of ways is actually what happened six weeks before then, which isn't, wasn't part of the original rock and racism letter. It was David Bowie and the whole stuff about whether he'd given the Nazi salute when he came back to Victoria Station or wherever it was. And then the interview he gave with Playboy magazine saying we needed fascism. Adolf Hitler was the first rock and roll superstar. Okay, he's coked off his head. But just think about the universal wave of love that met David Bowie rightly when he died. And think about how much he meant to people in terms of gender politics, in terms of music, in terms of a whole bunch of things. How, how he was so, so, so at the moment. And if someone like that can be attracted to racist or fascist ideas, then it shows you kind of what there was in the moment, as a, the moment of possibility for things to go in a bad direction. Now, if you're trying to think about um, what is the cultural moment today that enables the far right, pretty obviously it's not music. I mean, maybe I'm wrong here, but maybe someone says it's Kanye West or something, and that's, that's what's right. I don't know, I, I don't buy that. For me, it's the internet. It's Reddit and those weird chat rooms. It's YouTube. It's the way that um, if you're a far-left video blogger that comes themselves on YouTube, you know, well done, you've probably got 10,000 um, followers. But if you're PewDiePie, with his 60 or 70 million subscribers on YouTube, He's putting out um, Peppy the Frog memes and outright images and, and anti-Semitic um, films, and that's not stopping him having 60 or 70 million followers. There's an audience there, and there's a milieu which constantly creates... You know, why is it that in Britain, well, Britain London last year, we had the, the largest um, far-right street demonstration since the 30s? It's pretty obviously because Tommy Robinson's got a million Facebook friends. Well, why does Tommy Robinson have a million Facebook friends? Because there's all sorts of cultures of the far right which they're enabled to be part of and enabling them to grow. So pretty obviously, um, if we're trying to have a cultural movement against that, music doesn't solve the problems of YouTube. You know, looking for music to do that, I don't see it can be the same way part of the answer. But, it, but kind of another way to think about it is... I talked about Swastika. Think about Steve Jones and the Sex Pistols. He was photographed in 78, set up a new band called Sham, called Sham Pistols with people from Sham 69. And he's there with a great big swastika on. And it's 20 years later, he looks at him and he says, I don't know why I was wearing a swastika. I've never been racist. I've never had a racist thought in my entire life. Well, we don't believe that. But, but he wants to apologise for it. And he wants to say, I get it, that was wrong. I shouldn't have done that. Well, how are we going to get PewDiePie? <laughs> to write in his memoirs in 20 years' time. I did some really stupid things, but it's as, I was in my 20s, and, you know, I was doing too much coke or whatever, and I was, I was a thoroughly dislikable individual. And I thought about it now, I understand that was stupid. How did you get to that point? And it seems to me the first way to get to that point, at least as a movement, for us to be asking ourselves that question. How do we put that pressure on people like that so they change? Because if we're not asking that question, what are we doing with our politics, frankly? Um, so really to kind of to wrap it up, um, yeah, I'll wrap it up with a quote from Dave Widgery, who is one of the most rock and racism committee, 
and then just some thoughts about what this makes me think. This is him writing about the moment and what he thought had worked. It was a piece of double time, with the musical and the political confrontations on simultaneous but separate tracks and difficult to mix. The music came first and was more exciting. It provided the creative energy and the focus in what became a battle for the soul of young working class England. But the direct confrontations and the hard-headed political organisation which underpinned them were decisive. Now, he talks there a lot about the culture. And, and kind of, if I had to sum up why do I think the culture matters, I'd kind of put it like this. Often when you talk to people on the left, you think about how you defeat the far right. You think, in their heads they've got some notions a bit like this. Right, all the left get all our hard cases together. I right? get them on the streets. And they get all their hard cases together. They get them on the streets. I have a big punch-up brawl. And whoever brings the more hard cases wins. Um, just a gentle reminder, the National Front in the 1970s had 17,500 members. Like, the group that's often credited with rock against racism or the anti-Nazi League, the core of this resistance, a lot of these people are in the SWP. The SWP at this point had like 3,000 members. So they're at number six to one, and that's before you start asking how many of each group of skinheads and how many of each bloke of bokes and how many are in their early twenties. <laughs> really, if it was two lots of hard cases punching each other out, the left wouldn't have won. Um, and what need was needed was something to bring a bunch of people who weren't political onto the, onto the battlefield and change the terms, change the numbers. And that's, I'd say, still needed today. In the Witchery Quote, he talks a lot about um, hard-headed political organisation. And he, to the extent he does mean the far left and the organisations of the far left and the ideas of the far left. And that's actually part of the story too. You know, if, if you're a, we're in the TUC, I like to think if you're a revolutionary and you're in trade union, the way you go into a struggle, trade union struggle, all you bring is just a slightly different notion of we're going to get the most out of this as possible in that moment. We're going to fight to the death, if that's what it takes, to get... 20% rather than 3%, but we're really, really, really going to fight and we don't care how much it takes, because actually we're going to get the most of the situation we deliver. And for me that, that was kind of what the cultural Bolsheviks within Rock and Trace, we talked about the cultural bit of the cultural Bolshevism, but what the Bolshevik brought to them was that sense of like, this could be the moment in our lives when we have the greatest possible chance to really shift politics to the left. So in this moment we're going to do all that we can, and we're really going to do everything. And, you know, I think a bit of that spirit of that. I know there are people in the room who've got that spirit and stuff, but a bit of that back in terms of how it would be no bad thing. Um, and I've left the last confrontation. I've talked about that in terms of rock against racism. You know, um, they were fighting sometimes. They were physically fighting. I haven't talked that much about it, but it's part of the story. Sometimes they're physically fighting. But even when they're not fighting physically, they're always fighting politically. You know, they've got the sense that this is the battle of their lives. Um, so I suppose just to sum up, if you had to sum up what I'm saying, it's really just this. Um, yeah, should we bring back rock and racism? Yeah. But let's bring back the substance rather than just bring back the words, the labels, the forms. Let's actually bring back the spirit of it rather than necessarily the exact thing political organisation.